Okay, will we make a start? Yeah. Um, so I think it might be slightly behind on the live, but hopefully it'll work. Um, so hello and welcome to all who have joined with us um, for our first Q&A night. Um, thank you also to all who submitted questions. We got so many, which is very encouraging. Um, we might not get through all of them tonight, uh, but you know, we might do another at some point, so it'll maybe get answered then. So for those of you who maybe don't know me, I'm Ellie. I'm from Ullapool and I go to Loch Rue McCoy Free Church. Um, I also study down in Glasgow as well. So I'm going to introduce the rest of the panel. So Lachie, if you would like to introduce yourself. I am Neil Lachlan MacDonald, affectionately known as Lachie to most people. I'm minister in Loch Broom and Coyuch Free Church and delighted to be here and very thankful to Ellie for her vision and her willingness and her hosting capabilities online. Okay, I'm gonna ask each panelist uh, random question. So this is Lackey's. Oh. If you could visit anywhere in the world, where would it be? Um, probably um, JC Bamford in Staffordshire, which is the home of the JCB. Um, I've never been uh, and I would really love to go sometime and see where they make these marvellous machines. All right, very interesting. Um, Susan, would you like to go next? I'm Susan McLean. I'm the family worker at Lochie Community Church, which is in Pulieu and Old Bay, and also do a little bit of work at the uh, Loch Broom as well. And now for your random question, it is what song would you sing at a karaoke night? Well, the song that I would sing at a karaoke night has to be Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. And the reason is because I sing that song all the time and I don't even know what the proper words are. I make them all up. So I was going to do them by karaoke. I would see all the words on the screen and I would actually be singing the correct words. So that would be my choice. Yeah. That's a very good choice. Yeah, I like it. Dan, would you like to go next? Okay, my name is Dan. I'm a minister over in... Pool U and Alt Bay Cove area around Loch U, um, Minister of Loch U Community Church. Okay, now, um, if you were a superhero, what powers would you have? Oh, um, I think I would like a superhero memory. That's what I would like. So I don't forget my wife's birthday or <laughs> anniversary <laughs> or my children's birthdays. Love it. Fair enough. Okay, and now for our special guest, Bob Ackroyd. Hi, Ellie. Well, my name is Bob, and I'm obviously not from around here. I live in Edinburgh, and I've been in Scotland for the last 30 years. I teach and I have the distinction of having taught Dan and Neil Lachlan. All I can say is I did the best with what I had to work with. <laughs> Harsh, Brilliant. but true. Um, and for your random question, if you could eat one meal for the rest of your life, what would it be? Well, I think it would have to be um, pro uh, yeah, a prawn cocktail, like with large, you know, jumbo prawns. Um, then a uh, fillet steak with a mushroom sauce, uh, <laughs> dolphin wall potatoes, um, kind of a roasted asparagus with a hollandaise sauce. Then for dessert, uh, I think. I definitely like a strawberry cheesecake, New York style, about two inches thick. I haven't given this much thought, but <laughs> that would be what I would eat. It must be one thing, Bob. One thing. I like it. It was, a, it was, a, it was a meal. I'm sorry. I didn't tell you what to answer. <laughs> Brilliant. That was good. Um, okay, so we're just going to jump right into the questions just now. 
Um, and also, I should say, thank you very much to you guys for um, joining and doing these questions. Um, okay, we're going to start with some Easter themed questions. Obviously, that's why we're here. So um, we're going to start with why is Easter so important to Christians? And Susan, do you want to kick us off for that one? Yeah, I can start us off with that one, yeah. Well, this is a great question. Um, I think that Easter is a great time of year because spring has just started, it's holiday time, and there's lots of chocolate going on as well. But for um, Christians, Easter is actually far more than that. So to explain as to why Easter is so important to Christians, I think we need to look at Good Friday and also Easter Sunday. So Good Friday is the day uh, we remember about when Jesus died on the cross. So maybe that doesn't sound like such a good thing, but uh, Jesus wasn't like us. Jesus uh, was no ordinary man. Jesus is also God. Um, Jesus is perfect, no sin, and he lived every bit of his human life completely for God. But we, on the other hand, are not perfect uh, because we live for ourselves. We've got our own desires. We are selfish. We say and do lots of things that show that we're not perfect. There's a verse in the Bible in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 that says, indeed, there's no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. And just in case anybody thinks that's a little bit harsh and then maybe that doesn't quite apply to them, it goes on to say, don't pay attention to every word that people say or you may hear your servant cursing you. And this is the important bit. For you know in your heart that many times you yourself have cursed others. And I think there's probably none of us can really say that we've never passed comment on something that someone else has maybe said or done. So all these things that show that we're not perfect, uh, we call them our sins. And our sins are what separate us from God. And when Jesus died on the cross, he took the punishment for our sin so that we don't need to, so that we can be right with God. So Easter Sunday is when we remember that Jesus didn't stay dead. Uh, the Bible tells us that he rose from the dead. So based on that, why is Easter so important to Christians? Well, because of what Jesus did in the Easter story of Good Friday, for dying for our sins and Easter Sunday when he came alive again, there's four things I can think of right off the top of my head um, that, uh, that make this important for Christians. One is that we know that our sins are forgiven when we confess our sins to God. Um, our relationship with God has been repaired. Uh, we've got a living relationship with Jesus as we live our lives for him. And because he's risen from the dead, um, we're given the promise of eternal life with him. So that is why Easter is so important to Christians. But what we do need to remember as well, though, is that uh, Christianity is not just for Easter. It is a daily, lifelong commitment to Christ. And so we actually remember this, the things of Easter every single day of the year. That was great. Thanks, Susan. So does anyone have anything else they want to add? Yeah, I think you covered it pretty good, Sis. Yeah. Okay, then let's move on. Um, why did Jesus have to die such a horrendous death? Was there really no other way? And Lackey, if you want to start us off here. Okay, well, um, I think maybe Susan covered part of the answer to this question already with, with the answer to question one, but I think let's think about it rationally and, and hopefully coherently. Um, and because it's a, the free church, let's, let's think of three points, shall we? Um, number one, I think to answer this question, we have to consider the gravity of our sin versus the holiness of God, which are elements that Susan's already alluded to. We have to consider the fulfillment of God's word, um, scripture, prophecy, and we have to take into account the culture of the day in which Jesus lived. So 
if we take the first thing then, the gravity of our sin versus the, the holiness of God, we are all sinful. Susan's already alluded to that. We can call it lots of different things, moral failure, mistakes, criminal behavior, what, whatever it may be, but it all falls under the banner of what is known as sin. And sin ultimately leads to death. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. And what we earn then through the sins that we commit throughout our lives, uh, through the debt that we accrue over time with God, the, the outcome of that is that we die. And each and every one of us will die. Death is our greatest enemy. It's our most feared uh, foe um, because we will all die. And there is nothing that we can do to avoid that fact. We don't know when it'll come or how it will come, but we know that it will come. It may come in old age. It may come through an accident or through traumatic means. We just don't know. But we do know for us, for a fact, that everybody dies. So we're sinful people. That are, Susan said it there from Ecclesiastes. There is no one righteous, not even one. No one who seeks God. That There is enmity between us and God because of the fall of mankind, because of sin that entered into the world. And our sin is an affront to God who is holy. It's so offensive that we can't even look on it. So we are a people who are characterized by sin, but God is a person who is characterized by light, by truth, by justice, equity, compassion, grace, mercy, love, etc., etc. The list could go on. In him there is nothing crooked, there is nothing awry at all. Uh, he is wholly righteous. He is righteous and we are unrighteous. He is holy, we are unholy. He is patient, we are impatient. He is faithful, we are faithless, etc, etc. There is a vast difference between us and God. We are at polar opposites of the extreme, you could say. Um, but as human beings and as sinful human beings, we have a natural ability to downplay uh, our sin, to justify our wrongdoing, even to excuse our bad behavior. We are adept at the comparison game. Oh, well, I'm not as bad as so-and-so down the street who does this and who does that. And I'm not as bad as that person who thinks they're holier than thou in, in the church. But the point is that each and every one of us, regardless of who we are, where we're from, have transgressed, to have broken the law of God, his righteous standard, his perfection, and we can't attain that. A good friend of mine by the name Ackroyd once used the analogy of uh, somebody, an archer, a game of archery. Many of us have played that. And if you think about the archer, they step up to the line with their bow and arrow, they take aim and they, they try and hit the bullseye of, of the, the target. And if you take that as a metaphor and say, imagine a really righteous person in the world's eyes, a good, moral, upright person who does their best to, to, to do right and to be kind uh, and to fulfill all of the, the mantras that the world espouses to be good. They take their shot, they aim, and they are a whisker of the bullseye, just a whisker. And then you've got just a bit of a wretch, a bit of a rascal, somebody who does the bad things, naughty things, somebody who has committed great heinous crimes of, of evil, they take their shot. They're not even on the target. They're not in the garden. They're not even in the right place. They've, they've landed in the trees outside. They're miles away from the standard that is required by God. Point is, they've both missed the mark. We all miss the mark. So we're all sinful. We all miss the mark. And therefore, atonement must be made for our sin. And this is where Jesus Christ steps in to bridge the gap, so to speak, to take upon himself our sin. And that is a fulfillment of prophecy. It's a fulfillment of what has been promised from the very beginning in Genesis 3. And we'll maybe come back to that later. But you can think of various um, passages in the Old Testament that pointed forward to Jesus as one who would come and who would die, and who would die in the way that we see him die at Calvary, as a means of becoming an atoning sacrifice to pay the debt that we have accrued for such a long time. So Isaiah 53, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. 
Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray and each one has turned, each has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So we begin to see a picture of why or what the reasons were for Christ going to the cross, becoming a curse, bearing in his body the penalty of our sin, that he would die once for all to fulfill God's word that um, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life we could go to the old testament we could go to the psalm psalm 16 you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead nor will you let your faithful one see decay we can think of Jonah Hosea many different places so there's the gravity of our sin versus the holiness of God, the requirement for atonement. There is the fulfillment of God's word. And then there's the cultural context of the day. The Romans who were in power, they were a brutal people. They were adept at, at killing and they crucified many people. That wasn't unique to Jesus. Indeed, when we read the biblical account, we see that there were two thieves on either side of Jesus. Of course, crucifixion was reserved for those who were deemed to have committed the worst acts. Uh, but nevertheless, it wasn't an unusual thing. It was brutal. It was grim. And that should lead us to consider or to acknowledge, to recognize the depth of our depravity and our sin that Jesus would take upon himself in such a manifestly brutal way uh, to make atonement for our sin. So um, was there any other way? There was no other way. This was the way that God ordained and it was the only way that uh, our brokenness uh, could be paid for and so that we could be redeemed, reconciled, returned uh, to God. So the gravity of our sin versus the holiness of God, fulfillment of scripture and cultural context. I hope that answers it maybe a bit long-winded all right thank you Lachie. does anyone else have anything they would like to add i don't want to okay. spoil as many points <laughs> <laughs> okay well, away. we will just move on if that's okay yeah yeah sure yeah okay so um this one's for dan is it unfair to say that christ is the only way is it unfair to say Christ is the only way? I mean, I was about to say, that's a great question, but <laughs> we are all starting by saying that's a great question. That's an interesting question. If, if the person who asked that was in front of me, I would often respond by asking them, is it unfair for an atheist to say there is no God? Is it unfair for a Jew to say Jesus was just a man? Is it unfair for a, a Buddhist to say Hinduism is wrong? Now, what we're really grappling with in this question are two separate things. We have the concept of fairness and we have the concept of truth being exclusive. Basically that I'm right and you're wrong. As I said, it is a, it's an interesting question. It is a good question because this question is so relevant to our society today. Uh, if we take this idea of fairness to start with, the problem with fairness is that it's completely subjective. What's fair in my mind might not be fair in Susan's mind. And what's fair in her mind might not be fair in Ellie's mind. Uh, we can pick and choose what we find is fair or unfair. So we're going to go to the polls in a few weeks or months. Uh, we will vote for our political campaigns. The day after, one person will say, it's not fair my party lost. The next one will say, ah, there's justice in the world, we won. A slogan that became really famous during the presidential campaign of Trump and Clinton was that the truth doesn't care about your feelings. Now, it's a saying which has become politicized, but the point of it was that when you start making your feelings the basis for what we think the truth should be, 
as a society, we're in a world of trouble. So is it fair for Christians to say that they believe this? Well, fairness is just a dangerous area. So let's go on to the second bit, the concept of exclusive truth. Christians do say that the only way to God is through Jesus. And that infers that if you don't have Jesus, then you're not getting to God. And this is the point in Scotland we say, whoa, you can't say that. You can't say that you're right about your belief and everyone else is wrong. So in Scotland, what we would say is you need to change that to be, well, we're all right in our own way. No one can really be sure or Jesus is a way to God. And that sounds good. That sounds tolerant. That sounds nice. But the thing is, it doesn't actually work because every belief has an exclusive element to it. Every belief implies you reject another belief which doesn't uh, work with it. So Buddhism was born out of rejecting Hinduism. Atheism is born out of rejecting religion. Veganism was born out of rejecting Burger King or McDonald's, if you so prefer. All our beliefs contain an element of exclusivity. We reject other beliefs which do not go along with our own. So think about the very question that was asked there. Is it unfair to say that Christ is the only way? If you believe it's unfair to say that Christ is the only way, then you're also making that exclusive. You're saying everyone who disagrees with your view is wrong. And so often the way we get around this is we say, well, everyone's right. Hey, guys, just believe what you want. Everyone is right. But that doesn't work either, does it? Because even my kids at the age of five could tell you two things claiming to be true. If they contradict, they're not true. Atheism claims there is no God. Christianity claims there is a God. Both of them can't be right. We have to be willing to accept someone's wrong, someone's right. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm not preaching intolerance. You, you don't go around telling everyone, yeah, you're all wrong. And, you know, I'm not saying that. We have to learn how to engage respectfully. But I think this whole idea that we're all right in our own way, it's never stood up to the real test. I would encourage whoever asked this question, why do Christians claim Jesus is the only way? Uh, I'd encourage them to explore this and ask that very question of, well, what, what evidence is it that Christians look to to make that claim? On what basis are they making that claim? Because there must be something there for it to be one of the biggest religions with billions of people who follow it in their life. I'm going to stop there because I've rattled on enough. Did you want to add anything, Lafayette? No, I think Dan put it pretty well there. I mean, we don't need to go far to see the exclusive claim of, of Jesus himself, where he said, I am the way. I mean, there was, there was just that, that element. So there are, obviously, there's mounds of evidence that we could go to scripturally to back up. Um, but just what Dan's saying there, just encourage people to, to investigate and to look at the claims and, and check their veracity. And I think when people do look rationally at, at these things they do find that there is that there is truth there and truth has to be absolute yes okay let's move on to the next question it is how can a loving god send people to hell and if bob wants to kick us off with this one please thanks ellie this is a challenging question it's a good question we've said these are all good questions and i hope the person that's asked the question is really considering both halves of the question, namely the love of God and the reality of hell. Because this is a solemn truth. And, and let me come at it from, an, you know, Dan was mentioning a, a, about elections and, and polls. I mean, there's a lot of uh, you, people will be asked for their opinion. But let me take you back just 2,000 years ago to a very interesting public uh, vote uh, two people were placed before the public, and they were asked to choose. Now, that choice brought a consequence. They were told one of these men will go free. One of these men will be punished. Now, one of the men was called Barabbas. Now, 
Barabbas was a nasty piece of work. He was violent. He was an insurrectionist. He was condemned for his crime. And you would say, that's just. That's how the justice system works. Guilty people are to be punished. You can't just do your own thing your own way and live as if there are no consequences. So you would think that in this public vote that this is the kind of person that you would not want to be released. This is not the kind of person you would want as a neighbor. And then there was another option, because the other option was Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. He was called king. And what we know of Jesus is that he never did anything wrong. He never did anyone a bad turn. He never harmed anyone. In fact, quite the opposite. He healed the sick. He restored sight to the blind. He gave hearing back to the deaf. The lame could walk. Even the dead were raised. Now, you think of this choice. Here's the good man that's never done wrong. Here's the bad man that it seems as if no one, uh, he's never done right. And the choice was made. Away with this man. Give us Barabbas. You see, there's something strange about human nature that given the choice, we tend to make the wrong choice. Given options, we tend to choose the wrong one. There's just something within us that's not right. Our hearts, our minds. Now, we as Christians would say that, that that's sin. Sin makes us choose the wrong. Sin makes us do the wrong. Sin, when presented with such an obvious choice, chooses the bad man and not the good man. Now, the question was about love, and the question was about hell. Now, if you think of it this way, Jesus is God's son. Jesus is the beloved son of God, the only be begotten son of God. And God loved this world, and he sent his son into this world, not just to live a perfect life, but to die on the cross. So you see, the good man dies deliberately. The bad man goes free. So on a, in, in, in a real sense, in a physical sense, we could say that Barabbas could say, Jesus took my place. Physically. Jesus was crucified. Barabbas was sent free because the governor, when he asked the question, he, ans he, he honored the choice. And you see, God does give us real choices, and those choices have real consequences. But the strange thing is, is that in God's love and in his perfect plan, even this choice brought about good and blessing. The bad man goes free, the good man is punished so that we can be set free. Because what Barabbas experienced physically, we can experience spiritually, that Jesus can take our place, that he can be our substitute. Because on the cross, Jesus experienced the anger of God, and Jesus even experienced the absence of God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So a preacher of old once said, you can really summarize the Christian message in three short set statements. I deserved hell. By hell, we mean separation, separation from God, a place of punishment. The second statement is Jesus took my hell. He took that place of punishment. Why? Because God loves. He loves this world. He loves us. He loved his son, but he willingly allowed his son to die so that, and here's the third statement, if I deserved hell, if Jesus took my hell, nothing remains but his heaven. So hell is real. Judgment is real. And that reminds us of the Friday event that Susan was speaking of a moment ago that there on the cross, Jesus experienced punishment and separation. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, will, will not experience hell. Why? Because Jesus tasted that punishment, paid that price, bore that cross for us. So God is love, and God's perfect plan is a loving plan, and yet we all know deep down that there is a day of judgment, and justice is what is due. When we do things wrong, when other people do things that's wrong, 
but Jesus is able to transform our hearts and our lives, and even more than that, he can change our eternal destiny. So hell is no longer our destination. Heaven is our destination when our faith and trust is in him. That was a really good answer. Thank you, Bob. Um, okay, we'll move on to the next question. Um, this one is for Lahi. Why did Jesus come to earth to die for us when he did? Why not previously or now? Why come at all as before Christ people would enter heaven anyway? Well, this is a good question. <laughs> this is a, a tough question to answer, really, because in some ways we can't answer it. We don't truly know. But in, in saying that I can't answer it, I'm going to attempt to give some um, insight, hopefully, and, and, and an answer. And we'll call on the rest of the panel. They'll, I'm sure, be able to elucidate things far better than me. I think, firstly, we've got to consider God's sovereignty. God is sovereign. He is in control. He has the bigger picture. He has the divine plan that perhaps which we don't see, know, or always understand. And there are in life some things for us to know and some things for us that we won't know. Jesus himself uh, in Matthew 24 and, and Mark 13 said, but concerning the day and hour, he was talking about uh, end times uh, there are no one knows not even the angels of heaven nor the son but only the father so there are elements that god only god knows only god knows the timing of things only god knows when things are going to come to pass but what we do know is that very soon after the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, where Eve and Adam ate from the tree that they'd been commanded not to, that God, in meeting with them and challenging them in that regard, made a promise for a saviour to come. Genesis 3.15 is known as the Protevangelion, which is translated from the Greek to mean the first gospel, where he talks to the snake and he says, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God announced that there would be one who would crush Satan. Yes, that Satan would bruise him. Think of Christ on the cross that like we've just been reflecting on. This is referring to Jesus as a saviour to come. Uh, it took a while. Why did it take a while? Well, in God's sovereignty, he knew. But secondly, perhaps we could link it into God's faithfulness. Um, God gave time in order for mankind to learn more about who God is and what God is like, to learn about his promises, to learn about his truthfulness, to learn that Jesus would be uh, the, the sinless, spotless lamb of God, that he would be the sacrifice, that he would be prophet, priest and king without time to develop these things throughout history. And without the time for us to acknowledge them, then we would have no appreciation for the gospel, for our need of God or for our need of uh, Jesus. God knew the exact second when he intended to send Christ in, into the world, Galatians 4. But when the fullness of time came, Paul writes, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under law in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons and daughters. He didn't come earlier in order that we might learn faith, that we may know about him. But before faith came, Galatians 3, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So I don't have a definitive answer to the question as to why so long, but I think if we consider the sovereignty of God, and I think if we consider the faithfulness of God, these are some points of, of assistance and help for us. The second point of the question, because there's really two questions here, why come at all as before Christ people would enter heaven anyway? God is gracious and God is kind and people in the Old Testament before Jesus came were still sinners and who still broke the law of God, who still couldn't 
attain and maintain the standard that God requires. And though he gave them the law, he knew that they would break it in his sovereign knowledge. And so he provided them with a, an elaborate sacrificial system that reminded them of their shortcom- shortcomings, their inability to um, attain the, the standard God requires and to pay the penalty, in a sense, for their sins, whilst holding on to the promise of a Messiah to come. So they were holding on to the promise of Jesus to come in the future. Uh, we, of course, look back uh, to Jesus. The Old Testament Christians weren't saved by following the law because they couldn't follow the law fully. They were saved by the grace of God through faith in God and the Savior to come. David, the psalmist, uh, King David, he he wrote often uh, psalms, and in the psalms he speaks of the grace of God. Uh, Psalm 32, how blessed the one who has received forgiveness for his sins. Isaiah the prophet, one who wrote that magnificent book, he said, he recognized his own inability. He said, our good deeds are, uh, our good deeds are, our, our righteous acts are like filthy rags in God's sight. There's nothing that we can do. There's nothing that they could do to save themselves. It is by the grace of God through faith that we are saved. And that hasn't changed in a sense. So the sovereignty of God, the faithfulness of God, and the reality that we are all relying upon the grace, the mercy, and the love of God. Thank you for that, Lachie. Does anyone want to add anything? No? One thing to add, just as a person who studies history, as a time to come, it was a remarkable time. The Roman Empire, communication, transportation, if a new religious movement was to commence, that was not a bad time for it to start because very quickly the gospel finds its way to the center of the Roman Empire and from the center of the Roman Empire, it finds itself everywhere. So God's timing is always the best timing. And his ways are not our ways. Okay, we are going to do one more question and then we're going to play a song and have a wee break. So this one is for Susan and it is, if the thief on the cross waited until he was dying to become a Christian, is it not okay for us all to do that? Okay, thank you, Ellie. Um, that is actually a good question and it's a, um, an interesting question as well because it is one I think that people do maybe ask or speak about in different ways. Um, you know we might hear somebody saying something like um, oh, I'll wait till I'm older I want to live my life a little bit first or oh, Christianity that's just for older people that's not for, for young people. Uh, for those who don't know um, the story when Jesus was crucified uh, there were two thieves crucified at the same time and one of them turned to Jesus and one of them did not so the story of the thief in the cross has actually got a bit of significance uh, to me uh, two years ago uh, when my dad was dying he was very anxious about facing facing death he wasn't a Christian and he was really quite anxious um, about this. He wasn't at peace um, at all about it and um, my family thought it would be really good to get someone in to, to chat with him. Dan was actually away at the time so we asked Colin Gerlock uh, to come in and visit Dad which he did and he came in and he spoke to Dad about the two thieves on the crosses that were there at the same time as Jesus and the choices that they made. And although dad at this time had a bit of trouble articulating words, um, he we knew that there was a big change in dad after he'd had this discussion um, with Colin. He was completely at peace um, about dying and he loved to have the Bible read to him as, as well. So for us as a family, it was a great blessing um, that dad got that opportunity um, at such a late stage in his life. This was three weeks before Dad's passed, so he knew he was dying and he was able to do something about it. 
The thief on the cross knew that he was dying as well. And he had a much shorter time than dad. He was on the cross, so um, he knew that he was dying. And he also was able to do something about it. And I think there's no doubt when you're staring death in the face that you will give some kind of thought as to your eternal future. What is going to happen after I die? Um, both thieves on the cross would have been given that same opportunity, but one chose to follow Jesus and one chose not to. However, we're not all given that knowledge as to when we are approaching the end of our life. We don't all know when our last days are going to be. Our lives can change in a second and um, we might not be able to act in that way that the thief on the cross did and that dad did before we pass from time into eternity. And the Bible says um, a couple of things to us about that. And one is it says that now is the time of God's favour and now is the day of salvation. And the other one is do not boast about tomorrow for you do not know what a day may bring. So because of all this, my answer to that question would be that it's a bit risky to leave it until your dying days before turning to Christ because you may not know when that is and even if you do you might not even have the capacity to be able uh, to make that decisions afterwards so I would say to you is don't leave it it's great for those who have had that opportunity and able to do it but I would say don't leave it turn to Christ now while you still have the opportunity to do it yeah, and life in Christ is a fulfilled life, a satisfied life, not not an easy life, uh, but a satisfied life in that sense. And, you know, for those who have been around the block, so to speak, and have been to all corners of the earth and tried all different kind of things in the pursuit of satisfaction and meaning, you know, and have found it eventually in Christ that it's not in their belongings or their career or their relationships you can save people such a lot of heartache over time to say the only thing that will fill that god-shaped void to quote a cliche is god in christ jesus and uh, nothing else will give you the the satisfaction or the meaning uh, the fulfillment in life uh, that, that christ will and it's a good choice to make yeah the best choice i think as well it's it's understanding that christianity is about a relationship with God. And the, the question is like, well, if I wait till the very last minute, then I can get my ticket into heaven. You're not getting a ticket into a place, you're getting an eternity with a God who loves you. And it's resetting that mindset of, well, all I'm interested in is I get my spot in heaven where I'll be happy. Ask any Christian, they'll tell you, heaven without Jesus is not heaven. Mm. it's it's about coming to know someone to know they love you and you reciprocating that love and so the the question i would often ask someone to that is why on earth would you not want that now because the people who get it at the very last minute i'm no doubt they're they're thinking i wish i'd had this from the start mm. and the, i guess in, in what you're saying there dan it's is coming to the recognition or breaking down the misconception that Christianity is a straitjacket, that it is a shroud over your life, that it's going to suppress any idea of enjoyment or fun. No, quite the opposite, that, that the Christian faith liberates and brings joy and it fulfills meaning and all of these things. So it's not an oppressive list of rules, what you cannot do that perhaps people have the idea that it's just all about what you can't do and where you can't go and what you can't say and can't, can't, can't. No, it's not. It's a fulfilled life, full of joy in the Lord and pursuing the purpose that he has kept us here on earth for. Yeah, yeah I think I can't remember which person said it, but he said, he is no fool who mm. loses what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. Jim Elliot, the the missionary to the Auka Indians, yeah, he was killed. But yeah, that was, he was killed sharing, seeking to share Jesus with them. Yeah. He is no and fool Ellie, to give up. We, we yeah. better not go on too long now. <laughs> <laughs> Ellie's like, come you on. Have my question. 
<laughs> okay, um, we are going to play a song now, take a wee break. Um, I'm going to play Amazing Grace, sang by CJ and Anna. And so just bear with me one second while I try and share my screen. Okay, I love the bit. They sing it so well. It's so lovely. Okay, so we'll do a few more questions, but we won't. Um, we won't keep you all for too long. Um, so we'll just get straight back into it. Um, this one's for Dan. What's with God and healing? Praying for miraculous healing. Does it work? Seems more something other churches do, but not the free church. Why? Okay, um, right, break, uh, break the question in half. 
it seems something more other churches do than free churches. I, I cannot comment on uh, other churches really because I'm not in them. What, what I know is that in our church here, we absolutely pray for people. We pray for healing, but most often we do this at our Wednesday night prayer meeting. So if um, the person who asked this, I would usually ask, look, do you go to your prayer meeting? Do, in our own prayer meeting, Susan will kind of agree with me, I'm sure. We often take requests. What do you need pray for? Who needs prayed for? And we have seen uh, amazing answers to prayer. Sundays are a little bit different, especially online now, because you've got to be careful how much you share about people online, because anyone in the world can watch it. So I certainly would say to that person, if you're judging what a church prays for simply by a Sunday live stream, that's not, not a, probably a wise decision, because you're only getting a glimpse of a church life. Uh, churches usually have a very committed prayer group and people will be saying I need prayer for this I need prayer for that so I'd encourage that person go along to your prayer meeting and if you really feel that it doesn't happen then talk to your minister but the other bit in that and I'm not going to go on too long I promise you this is the whole concept of praying for healing um, if you were to come into our church here and ask the people have you prayed for miraculous healing and seen it they would tell you yes um, but at the same time, I can also tell you we've prayed for miraculous healing and it's not happened. OK, praying for healing. It's not like it's performance related that if you've been good enough and you ask God, you'll get it. And it, it's not like, well, you've got to pray the right way. If you just pray the right way, God's like a genie that you can just rub the lamp. Here's my wish and you'll get whatever you want. The honest truth is that sometimes God answers our prayers miraculously heal someone. I have seen it. Susan has seen it. We have known it within our own family lives. But then as painful as it is, sometimes people we have loved, we have prayed fervently for, and they have not been healed. And the honest truth is, we don't always know why. We are not God. We don't know his purposes. But for me as a Christian, when life doesn't go the way I want it, I'm reminded that God is a good God. And he does good things. And ultimately, this life is broken by sin. And I'm not going to get it right. I'm not going to get it the way I want it all the time. I'm not going to get out of pain and suffering. But my hope is located in the next life, where there will be no pain. There will be no suffering. There will be no misery. Sometimes in this life, we get a glimpse of that when someone is miraculously healed. Other times, in God's wisdom, the answer is no. And I think anyone would be foolish to try and say they can tell you why God did or did not answer a prayer for healing. It's out of our reach. There's a reason why he is God and we are not. So there's a very quick answer to a massive topic. And it's, it's always interesting, too, when you get, um, you know, when you think about the sort of faith healers that you see sometimes on television you see them on television doing the collection around the large crowds but you don't see them going down to the local leprosy mission or to the local hospital to carry out their miraculous healings there so we've always got to be wary of, of certain things that claim to claim that which is perhaps extra biblical yeah i think so there's there's been sadly people have used people's vulnerabilities to make money in the name of God. And that yeah. is, unfortunately, it's not just in Christianity, it's in every sphere of life. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Our next question is, how can we trust the Bible since it's thousands of years old? And someone else asked, how can we know the Bible is true? So similar questions. Mm -hmm. And um, Bob, if you would like to kick us off here. Thanks, Ellie. I mean, there's a lot, a lot of ways you could answer this. I mean, the Bible says that it is true, that it is God's word, and God always speaks the truth. But I would maybe kind of connect this with our Easter reflection in that when we think of Jesus on the cross, we think of what God does for us. And when we think of what we describe as the new birth, 
we think of what God does in us. And one thing that God does in us is that he changes us from the inside out. He, he gives us a new heart. He gives us a new mind. He comes to live within us, the Holy Spirit. And in so doing, we now have this new relationship that we not only read the Bible, because you can read the Bible, uh, but we read the Bible and we know that this Bible is from God. It's for us. And, and we, we, we can hear our Father speaking to us and we can speak to him. So we, we now have this relationship where there's a dialogue. And like Dan was saying before, sometimes with regard to prayer, we don't know what it is, but, but we do know that it is. Um, I can tell you things about the Bible, but I can also just say that as I read the Bible, I, I read God's word from God for me, just as, as a simple illustration. Uh, maybe it was because it was long distance. When my mother always phoned, she would begin the conversation by, hi, Bob, it's mom. Now, I didn't need her to tell me it was mom. I knew her voice. I recognized the way she spoke. I, I mean, it's just because I had heard that voice my entire life. And I also, I knew who it was. That, not only did I know the voice, but I, I just knew everything about her. And I loved her and I knew that she loved me. And, and there is something about the work of the Holy Spirit that enables us to believe and to trust in God and to trust in his word, knowing that it comes from him and knowing that he wants the best for us, he wants to help us, not to hurt us. He wants to teach us. He wants to lead us. So there are many answers to that. But I would say deep down, if you're a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives within you. And you recognize God when he speaks. And you recognize God's word for what it is. In, in, in a sense, until you experience that, it's hard to describe but when you do experience that, you know it, and you know it for sure, and you recognize that voice as crystal clear as I recognize my mom's voice on the telephone. I just knew who it was. That's great. Thank you. Okay, I think we have time to fit in one more question. Um, so I think we'll go for this one and this is for Susan and um, sometimes I kind of feel a bit sorry for Judas as if it wasn't him someone else would have had to be the traitor does Judas deserve a bit of sympathy okay thanks very much Ellie um just to maybe just explain in case somebody anyone out there doesn't know who Judas was uh, Judas Iscariot was one of the 12 disciples um, so those who were closest to Jesus, uh, he walked with Jesus, talked with Jesus, saw and heard so many um, amazing different things. He ate with Jesus and then he betrayed Jesus, which led to Jesus being arrested and then crucified. And he also earned some money for himself um, for handing Jesus over as well. So does uh, Judas deserve any sympathy uh, for what he did? Um, so Judas was a thief who made a choice to uh, betray Jesus for money. So this doesn't sound like someone that you would normally have maybe a lot of sympathy for. However, he wasn't the only disciple to let Jesus down. Um, in fact, all the other disciples let Jesus down as well. And they had the same experiences as Judas, and yet they still um, let him down as well. So um, before we think, oh, well, that's absolutely terrible, um, we need to remember the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, when he says, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So, um, I used to think as well, oh, that's a bit tight on uh, Judas. How come he was picked to be born to betray Jesus and whatever? And I think when I was thinking that, and maybe whoever has asked this question um, as well is, but I know myself, when I was thinking that a way back in the day, that I wasn't really thinking about my own sin at all. I was that busy looking at what Judas did 
I wasn't focusing myself on how mm. I let Jesus down um, as well. And sometimes, well, we spoke about choices. I think Dan was mentioning choices earlier on. That um, we all have choices to make um, every single day, and sometimes we make bad choices. Judas made a bad choice, um, and we find ourselves in the same situation as well because of our sin. We let down Jesus constantly. We live for ourselves. We've tried. We've got idols in our heart. We say do things that are not honouring to God. And um, but as Christians, we repent of our sin and we turn to Jesus as well. The result of what Judas did in betraying Jesus, um, the result of that was the mistrial that Jesus was then given, and then ultimately the crucifixion of Jesus. But this was actually only the practical route that got Jesus to the cross. So what uh, Judas was used in the practical route uh, to get Jesus to the cross. Jesus wasn't on the cross just because Judas betrayed him. Jesus, Judas, uh, sorry, Jesus was on the cross because of all of us, of what we have all done. Jesus was there because of our sin, which has already been spoken about tonight in some of the other answers. So should we show sympathy for Judas? Well, I guess we should maybe show sympathy for anyone who doesn't give their heart to Jesus and live their lives for him. And I think this is why it is important that we do share the good news about Jesus with other people. But I think this really shows us how important it is for each of us to make sure that our own hearts are right before God. Yeah, I, th I think as well with Judas, he's an interesting character. But the, uh, the question I think that often remains about him is, what would have happened if, Jesus, if Judas had stuck around? What would have happened instead of him looking within himself and he takes his own life, if you're not familiar with it, he went to Jesus because soon Jesus would rise from the dead and show complete victory over the worst sins that we can imagine. Jesus has conquered them. It's not like some people think you can be forgiven if you've done A to N, but anything from uh, P through to Z, ah, you can't be forgiven for that. No, Jesus said, I can forgive you for all your sins. And so I always wonder if Judas had stuck around and went to Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, maybe things would have been different for him. As Peter saw. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, I also think it's important to notice that there's a difference between regret and repentance. Mm -hmm. You can be sorry for something you've done. You can be sorry for hurt that you've caused, and you can feel bad. The Bible talks of repentance where you have a change of heart that's based on a change of mind, and that's an about face. Judas did not repent. That's the sad end of the Judas story. All who repent and believe are saved. All who refuse to repent remain in that state of separation from God. And I think with Judas, we can sympathize in terms of uh, there, but for the grace of God go I, that we are all capable of things that perhaps we think we're incapable of. Um, but we can't justify what he did. Uh, so we can sympathize, but we can't justify it. And like Bob says, the requirement was repentance. And if he'd repented, he would have been restored, received, forgiven, just as Peter was, just as we all are, if we will repent. But he didn't. And that's quite solemn, quite uh, scary, it's stark, isn't it? But that, that forgiveness is offered to absolutely anyone who will repent, regardless of who you are, where you've been, what you've done. Repentance is yours. In, redemption is yours in Christ through repentance, conviction, confession, and repentance of sin. That would have been that for Judas too, but he chose another way. So I think we're going to leave it there. Um, as I said before, we don't want to keep you all for too long. Um, 
I know we didn't get through some people's questions um, and as I said before, we might do another one. But in the meantime, I want to stress that if anyone wants to have any further conversations about any of these topics, then I'm sure these four lovely people will be happy to have conversations with you about that. So um, I'm just going to pass on to Lackey, who's going to talk about um, the rest of the week. Yeah, well, just a, a big thanks to, to you, Ellie, for your vision for this evening and for hosting it and doing all the technical wizardry and making all of these things possible. We're thankful for you and for your willingness and to, to Bob for joining us and, of course, to Susan and Dan. Uh, and we trust that some of what we've said has uh, helped to answer some of the questions. We recognise there were quite a few questions we didn't get to. But like Ellie says, hopefully we can certainly do this on another occasion. And if there are other questions you wish to answer, it's totally anonymous. That form that Ellie set up, we have no idea who submitted these questions. So there is total anonymity. You can ask absolutely anything. We can't promise we'll be able to answer absolutely anything, but we will endeavour and do our best uh, to do that. This week is obviously Easter, uh, central to our faith as Christians as we uh, contemplate Jesus' death uh, and his resurrection and uh, how that informs our lives and our faith. And in that regard, uh, we're going to be having a, a short service um, that will go out on Friday uh, and that will be made available on the usual channels. And then and Dan will be speaking at that. And then on Sunday, uh, I'll be uh, preaching our, our usual Sunday service. Uh, and again, that'll go out on YouTube and Facebook as usual. So we would encourage you to join in with that. There may be things in there that answer more questions that you have as we celebrate uh, the resurrection, for that is the very thing that dictates really every aspect of our faith. And everyone's welcome, and we'd encourage you to interact and, and share with that. Um, maybe tonight as we close, maybe we could ask Bob, would you just say a word of prayer as, yeah. as we close? and then we can let people go. Thanks, Bill. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for your goodness to us. Thank you for this opportunity to think and to reflect upon the message of Easter, the death of our Lord Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We give you thanks for his love, his grace, and his mercy. Thank you for uh, the panel that have gathered together, for Ellie, who has organized us, for Lockie and Dan and Susan, for everyone who is listening now, for those who have sent in questions. We ask, Lord, that you might do the impossible, that you might change hearts and lives, that you might continue to work in us, that you might work through us. We thank you that in our weakness, your strength is seen, and in our limitations, your unlimited grace and mercy is demonstrated time and time again. Help us, encourage us, and strengthen us, we pray, and all for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Ellie. Thanks again to everyone for coming. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to everyone who sent in questions. I hope you all have a lovely Easter. And we should just maybe put the caveat, we hope to post this on YouTube yes. uh, because it has been recorded, but it wasn't recorded just right from the very beginning, but that's all right. We'll overcome that. Yes, I knew, will... <laughs> I knew I would forget. I It'll knew be, I would forget. It will be available. Uh, <laughs> as soon as we can make it available to you so you can refer back to it if you wish there we go okay bye everyone <laughs>